Babe, wake up. A new toad has dropped. We have incredible news of a new volcano toad from Mount Kenya reveals an ancient lineage. Uh, in today's video, we are going to cover this new species that has been described very, very recently, break down the paper, the science of how they're actually doing it, and take a little time to discuss this biogeographical theory, one of my favorite concepts from biology, evolution, uh, all things science. So timestamps down in the description. If you want to support what I'm doing, like, comment, share, subscribe, do all the things that YouTubers tell you to do, and uh, subscribe to me on Patreon. Look at that. First take. Did that. Incredible. Let's get into the paper. Now, I originally found this article uh, from Mongobay that is detailing well, this new species. Uh, however, like everything, I always try to go to the original source to better understand what we are finding. And realistically, what this is, is a new species of toad. But it's not just a species split. It's not just, um, you know, a, a, another species that has been well known and we just found it. This is uh, placed inside of its own genus. It is so distinct from the other frogs in the region, it warrants being uh, placed at the genus level rather than the species level. So uh, this is in the <laughs> Kenya, right? Uh, so this is around the Eastern Rift. This is in Eastern Africa. And this is a very, very geologically, geographically dynamic area. Okay. And so we're going to discuss the biogeography of this species, uh, the potential biogeography. But first, I feel like it's good to actually show you what this species is. So here are some sketches as well as photos of the preserved specimen. The species name, our proposed name, is Kenya Fernoides volcani, uh, referencing the fact that it is in Kenya and it is found on a volcano. Um, here is a picture of said volcano. Really, really cool. So uh, this specimen has been euthanized and preserved and is placed in a museum. Uh, this is uh, the holotype. So the holotype is the specimen by which all other specimens are compared to. And holotypes are important for research. They are important for science. Um, I am very happy that we are moving more towards digital techniques instead of these, uh, well, euthanasia of animals because um, there's many issues there that we could spend a long time going down. But I also completely understand, if I remember correctly from the article, this specimen uh, was actually preserved eight years before this publication was done, and they just finally uh, described it, which um, is a very uh, common occurrence in biology of taking eight years to publish something. So the paper goes in depth on the etymology, the diagnosis, which is saying uh, like all the little nitty gritty particulars of this species, things like lack of a tympanum, forearms without a large glandular mass, present in uh, Trumeridae and some Nectophrenoidae species, spatulatite toe tips. Um, I'm not going to read all of these. I'm not going to go deep into this. I believe that if you want to know it, go into this paper, read it yourself. Um, so this is only known from the Chogaria forest block on Mount Kenya. Uh, so I believe this article, here we go. So it is really only known from here. Uh, this photo is a little bit more clear uh, than the one in the article. It's also going through different um, ranges, uh, talking about the different canopy usages of indigenous trees, closed canopy, open canopies. That's why these colors are changing. But uh, this frog is only found from this region, so really only found on Mount Kenya. So when I first read this, I was very, very fascinated, right? Let's look at the other pictures of frogs. So freaking cool. Um, so these are the holotype again, just various views of that frog. Uh, but when I saw that it's only found on a volcano, my mind started getting into the biogeographics. Um, biogeography studies how and why species are distributed the way they are. And what's interesting is that Mount Kenya is about 3 million years old. It is a very recent uh, mountain, very recent uplift in terms of geography, in terms of global geography. But this frog, based on the phylogenetic analysis, they were able to get um, genetic sequences from it. I believe they have five loci, um, five, yeah, whatever. Uh, they were able to determine that here in purple, that it is a clade, it is a genus that dates back 20 million years. So how do we make sense of this biogeographically? That's what I wanted to know, and that's what these authors also want to know. So they detailed a little bit of information already. 
So uh, just to give you a highlight of the geography of this area, not all Afro-temperate regions share the same geological history. However, the East African Rift, an active continental rift zone, consists of both old, over 25 million years old, uplifted mountains, such as the Ethiopian Highlands, the Eastern Arc Mountains, and parts of Kenya, and more recent volcanic highlands, such as Mount Kilimanjaro, which is only around a million years old, and Mount Kenya, which is around 3 million years old. So realistically, this is a, like, like I mentioned, this is a very geographically uh, and geologically active area where we have regions like they were saying, um, here we have uh, Mount Kenya and the uh, Kilimanjaro is around here somewhere, um, but they are very, very recent uplifts. Uh, in a general, very, very, very general sense, uh, the taller mountains that we know of in the world, those are recent, and then the older mountains are typically smaller because they have millions of years of erosion. Um, that's why the, the Appalachians out in the eastern United States, those are old mountains and they feel like it, where things like Mount Everest, Mount Kilimanjaro, they are recent. They are very recent. So they're still being pushed upwards, right? But what was interesting with this group is that the biogeographic history of this area is still not very well understood because there are taxa that seem to be connected. Oh, yeah, they also did a skull stuff. So cool. Skeletons. Mm. Here we go. I'm looking for my notes. Oh, they deleted my notes. Okay. So, the discovery of K. volcani, which is this species here, corroborates the existence of old forest connections between the volcanic mountains of Kenya and the ancient crystalline mountains of Tanzania, thought to have shared only a recent biogeographical history. The estimated age of divergence of Kenyophrenoides and uh, another group, uh, Chiramidae and Nectophrenoides, around 20 million years. That's when they diverged. Uh, again, on the phylogeny, they diverged about 20 million years ago. And the age of Mount Kenya is a notable discrepancy and one that is a current biogeographical conundrum. Now, uh, the authors were a little bit reserved on their... Um, reasons for why. They, they do list some possible reasons, such as Pleistocene colonization events, meaning uh, very recent colonizations. But of course, we really don't know. We just have various theories. So what I'm going to do is posit my own various theories. Uh, so whenever I think of an organism that is found only on a mountain, what I think of are island biogeography. Uh, so of course, if we're talking about islands in an ocean, so these are various islands, um, we know these as, uh, well, island biogeography. Some organisms may only be found on one particular island. Uh, other organisms may be found on several islands, and there are going to inevitably be organisms that are found on all three islands, uh, possibly, right? And so the really big question for biogeography is, well, how does this happen, right? What constrains an organism to one island versus what, uh, what enables organisms to be on multiple islands? So uh, dispersal capability of the organism in question is very true. Say this orange square is a bird. Uh, birds are not as affected by islands, so they can just fly to the next island, right? But perhaps the other organisms, the, uh, the blue and red circles or purple circles in this example, perhaps they have very low dispersal ability. What could have happened is these islands could have formed around them. There might have been a situation millions of years ago, let's say uh, 10 million years ago, right? These islands were not separate islands. In fact, uh, perhaps they were actually connected, okay? So perhaps the blue organisms were found throughout the islands. But then uh, rising sea levels, rising water, uh, any type of geographic event may have caused this island to split into and then become two islands. This is a geographic barrier that splits out populations so that they can no longer cross over. Maybe this is a frog and these big ocean areas cannot, um, um, they, they cannot cross it. But maybe now you're wondering, why the hell am I talking about islands in the ocean when this is very clearly mountains in Kenya? It's because the concepts still apply. This is a top-down view, right? We are looking at a top-down view of islands in the ocean, but, 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 if we rotated this, if we rotated our perspective, right, and twisted it, 
we could see mountains as islands, right? So say organisms only exist, they can only exist at a high elevation, okay? You can think of this very similarly to islands in the water. So perhaps those blue organisms can only exist at the tops of the mountains and they have no easy way of crossing over. Perhaps they, they can't fly, they can't jump across the mountains and going below this zone, this zone that we have uh, so adequately illustrated with fake water, perhaps going here is instant death. If they come down to the mountains, um, they die because it is too hot, for example. It's colder at the tops of mountains, right? Um, and so, therefore, it is very difficult for this organism to cross over to this mountain. So, when we think island bi biogeography, we also think of mountains. They do count in island biogeography. And they don't just have to be on the tips. Um, organisms often exist in bands on the islands. So uh, let's say here it's only you know 500 meters to 1,000 meters is where the organisms are found. They can't go lower. They can't go higher. So again, it's very difficult for them to cross over. So how does this work? How do species get into these zones? How do they actually become islands uh, in terms of mountains? Well, I'm going to discuss two different ways okay so the first is that say we have some mountain okay uh, the mountain already exists it is you know being created whatever uh, it is three million years old so it's still rising a little bit but uh, you have some organism that maybe exists at the bottom okay then uh, you know over time maybe climatic fluctuations maybe uh, randomly, uh, maybe any number of different reasons, they start going up in the mountains. So uh, let's say at, uh, let's just go 10 million years ago, they are mostly found at the lower at the base of the mountains at sea level, for example, and then maybe at uh, 9 million years, uh, over time, they've moved up about 500 meters on average, um, and so on and so forth. So another million years passes, and now they are found a little bit higher up. Uh, this doesn't have to happen in millions of years, this could be thousands of years, as well. Uh, that actually is maybe a little more likely in this scenario since we are talking about um, Pleistocene glaciations, so meaning that the glaciers are coming in uh, during ice ages and then going out during periods of non-ice age like we are in now. Um, so organisms do shift their ranges and perhaps up a mountain was a much better way. But then uh, they became accustomed to a particular spot, uh, so say maybe uh, five thousand years ago, um, this is where they uh, existed. And now they have no reason to come back out. And it is much more difficult for them to go to different areas. So this is just like where an organism can live. So that is one methodology, or one, uh, one theoretical, one conceptualology, conceptology. Um, another is that this this does happen okay it's a little more rare but it does happen uh, it does happen with very rapid uplifts okay so say we have some region okay some region like this let's let's say that we're looking at it from the ground right and we have some region here okay so this is like looking at it from the side so it's it's just like this right like imagine you're you're just poking your head out of the pond right and so you just see a flat plane what can happen is as the tectonics are occurring, uh, so species exist throughout this range, but then the mountain starts to develop, okay? First we have a little baby bump, okay? And the species are still existing there. Um, over time, over millions of years, these species are still evolving, but the mountains are also evolving. The mountains are also changing over time. They're getting larger, and larger. Think of each of these bands like a uh, hundred thousand years, right? Hundred thousand years to move up maybe a few hundred more meters, right? So over time, this is forming. The mountain is forming beneath them. The volcano is forming beneath them. And the species are essentially lifted up the mountain, okay? They don't have a high dispersal ability, um, so they're not traveling many, many kilometers away. They're really just staying put in one area. Um, so of course, in a frog, this is quite likely. Frogs don't have crazy mobile life histories. This can also cover things like spiders um, and other insects that don't move a whole lot. Imagine a burrowing spider that sits in a burrow. Uh, they don't have crazy dispersal patterns. So uh, the mountain can literally form beneath them. And these organisms are still evolving, okay? So uh, the species they were 10 million years ago is not the species they are today. Um, 
They likely diverged many, many times over the course of their evolutionary history. And both of these are perfect scenarios. The authors do kind of mention both of them, uh, more on the Pleistocene glaciation one, um, which is the one that makes sense. But there was that issue, right? There was that issue within the paper of the fact that this mountain, three million years old, okay? Um, going back into it. This mountain, three million years old. These, this genus of frog, 20 million years old. So how do we rationalize that? How does this make sense? They thought they were connected, and this frog shows that this was connected to other mountains that are much older. But did the frog go up the mountain? I have a particular theory that is based on the notion that this is the only frog within the genus that they are proposing. A fundamentally overlooked component of biogeographic studies is the role of extinction. So we have a phylogeny here. So imagine this is what the phylogeny of the species looked like. Okay, so we have our blue. This is going to be our current living extant species, extant being the opposite of extinct, okay? And this whole phylogenetic tree, okay? This root down here, let's say this is that 20 million years old, okay? Let's say that. All of these species here, the, uh, the, the, the reddish ones and the orange ones, perhaps they are extinct. Now, today, they're extinct. And we have no way of knowing these relationships, okay? This is theoretical. Perhaps, perhaps, these species were widespread. So we had the, 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 the red triangles, uh, maybe even up in the mountains. Uh, perhaps we had even more of the red squares all over the area, maybe going to those older mountains, right? The ones that we discussed uh, that are back this way over here. Okay, I'm going to move myself way out of the way. Uh, so the older mountains, perhaps all of these organisms were actually very widespread throughout this area, right? Um, including the orange ones, right? So maybe the orange ones were also found all over, all over the mountains. Okay, but then what happens when all of these organisms go extinct? What happens when our red groups go extinct? What happens when our orange groups go extinct? And now we have a phylogeny that doesn't show all of these branches. It doesn't show the split between our blue circles and the orange group. It doesn't show the very ancient split between the red groups and the orange groups. Instead, it only shows this as a single branch extending 20 million years back in the future to today. This is a known occurrence, okay? Perhaps, uh, let's say that this is not drawn to scale, this my phylogeny is not drawn to scale. Perhaps this split right here happened three million years ago. Perhaps this split between the blue and the orange actually happened three million years ago, and that coincided with the formation of Mount Kenya. And it was that formation that directly led to that split. It created that geographic barrier we talked about, right? In essence, that split might have occurred just like this, where that species is no longer able to go to other areas. We would not be able to tell because we are missing information. We are missing information due to extinction. We have no information currently available for these species. And the fact that this frog is the only living member that we know of, of that genus, indicates to me a history of extinctions. Okay, so again, if we go back to the paper, and we look at their phylogeny right here. You see this long branch for the purple. The purple is the species we're talking about, Kenya Phrenoides volcani. Perhaps this singular branch actually did look like this one down here, this Nectrophrenoides. But due to extinction, 
we can only detect a single branch. Meaning, we lose all information from these nodes of this phylogeny. So these are the questions that I am deeply interested in. These are the questions of biogeography, of biogeographical analyses that I love to answer. And of course, the authors may be thinking this as well. Um, the authors probably have some idea. They probably are investigating more and more uh, because biogeography is an awesome field with so many cool questions. Um, but anytime I do see a singular long branch that is supposed to be something that is very unique, very different, I tend to think that it is a branch that is uh, missing other species. Right. Um, I think of this often, the fact of how extinctions uh, or the lack of knowledge of extinctions is influencing our biogeographic analyses and our understanding of how species are formed around the world. There are methods that account for extinction, of course, but without this information, there's only so much we can understand. And that's where I'm going to leave you today. So if you liked this video, you know, comment, like, share, subscribe, do all those things that YouTubers tell you to do. If you have any cool biology information or you want me to nerd out on biogeography a little bit more, um, let me know. And I would be happy to do so. Um, with that, I really do hope you have a good day. Um, links for everything, including my Patreon. If you want to support what I do for less than a cup of coffee a day, a month, I appreciate you greatly. Have a wonderful day.